Welcome to Heritage of Faith. How you doing this morning? Everyone stand to your feet. Well, it's so good to see you today. And, and I believe today, someone's life will never be the same. Say, just, just say, this out, say this out loud. My life will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Father, we welcome your presence in this place today, and we just thank you that we celebrate your goodness. We declare that today we will see marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. We celebrate your faithfulness, we celebrate your goodness, and we just thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Give him a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. We're gonna take a little step into the past with this first song, so I want you to have fun with it. But let your motivation be this. Put everything God has done for you up as a memorial as you sing this. And begin to fuel your faith with all the amazing things God has done in your life. Can you do that for us? And then have fun in the process. You ready? Here we go. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. Oh, I'm going to praise his name. Each day he is the same. Come on and praise Him. Look what the Lord has done. Yeah. Y'all ready? Come on. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. Oh, 
promises are yes, they're amen, and they're from me. I want you to point to yourself, say, his promises are from me today. Oh, yeah. 
the Lord a good shout. Give the Lord a good shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Carol and I were just talking when we first came into this in 1969, or for myself anyway. First time we heard Kenneth Hagin. Vicki Jameson always sang that song. It was a theme song in the Hagin ministry. Carolyn remembers singing it as a child in the William Brannan meetings. Only believe. Say it with me. Only believe. Only believe. Look at your neighbor and say, only believe. only believe. That's what Jesus said to Jairus when his situation looked impossible. His daughter had died. He was believing that Jesus would come and lay his hands on her, raise her from the dead. But in the process of him ministering to the little woman with the issue of blood, the messenger came and said, don't trouble your master anymore. Your daughter's dead. Jesus turned to him immediately and said, only believe. Only believe. In other words, don't let the circumstances be final authority. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't let your circumstances be final authority. Only believe. Tell them again, only believe. Now lay your hands on them right now and say, I'm going to pray for you. And I believe the situation that you're believing God to turn around is possible. God will do it. Only believe. So pray for them right now in Jesus' name. Father, I pray over this audience, whatever they're believing God to turn in their lives, whatever circumstances they're facing, I pray in the name of Jesus, they won't give up, they won't grow weary, they won't quit, they'll continue to stand on the authority of your word, and God, you're the God that specializes in the impossible. You do impossible things, and we thank you in advance that it's happening even as we pray, hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord your best shout right now. Hallelujah. 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 Sing that chorus one more time. Only believe. Sing it out. to those Kenneth Hagin meetings in those early days. Our daughters were very young and Brother Hagin would come to Fort Worth and he'd preach over at Bob Nichols Church when he was, Bob Nichols was in that old, had been an abandoned post office, turned it into a church on Berry Street, Brother Copeland's office right next door or on the opposite side of the street. We could hardly wait Brother Hagin to come. We'd go with the Copelands and we'd sit there and, and Jerry and Terry were just real small. They, they were glued to Brother Hagin, watching everything he did, everything he said. Of course, I was too. We believed for a front row seat and uh, so we could watch and hear. And Vicki Jameson would come out and sing that only believe, only believe. Brother Hagin would pray for people. They'd fall out on the power of God. We'd get home and Jerry and Terry would line up all her baby dolls. <laughs> and Jerry was Brother Hagin and Terry was, was uh, Vicki Jameson. And Terry would stand there and sing, only believe, only believe. Jerry Ann would say, receive your healing, knock them all over, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So 
That song has great meaning to the Savelle household, praise God. Amen. We welcome you here this morning. Welcome our television audience. And uh, we appreciate you being here and we appreciate you viewing, praise God. So today, uh, I've had uh, a deep impression by the Holy Spirit over the last several days to talk to you this morning about increasing your level of expectancy. Increasing your level of expectancy. And particularly where the prophetic word is concerned for this year. Marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. Say it with me. Marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. The actual words expect or expectation or expectancy are not seen very frequently in the Bible, but the principle is all over the Bible. Now, there is another word that the Bible uses that means the same thing. But let me give you a couple of examples of where you can find the word expect or expectation. Uh, first of all, in Psalm 62, 5, the psalmist says, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. My expectation is from God. Do I have any right to expect good things to happen in my life? I certainly do. And I get up every morning expecting good things to happen in my life. I learned from Oral Roberts years ago, something good is going to happen to me, praise God. Look at your neighbor and tell him, something good is going to happen to me. <laughs> and then in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 18, it says, for surely there is an end and thine expectation shall not be cut off. Thine expectation shall not be cut off. The Amplified reads this way. For surely there is a latter end, a future and a reward, and your hope and expectation shall not be cut off. And then the message translation says, you won't be left with an armload of nothing. Ooh. Hallelujah. You won't be left with an armload of nothing. And then the word that the Bible uses more frequently that has the same meaning as expect or expectation and expectancy is the word hope, the Bible word hope. Now, so many Christians have reduced the meaning of hope. And to hope to a lot of Christians is, well, we're just hoping and a praying. And there's really no confidence in that. And the word hope from a Bible definition means a confident expectation. Amen. Amen. So if you were saying with a Bible definition, I'm hoping and praying, you would say it with joy. You would say it with expectation, not we're just hoping and a praying. Amen. And that's probably the reason why that hope to most Christians has lost its true meaning. The Bible says, listen to this, in Romans chapter 15, and I'm reading from the, uh, uh, what is this? The, uh, well, it's another translation. I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> listen to this, Romans 15, 13. I pray that God, who gives hope, will bless you with complete happiness and peace because of your faith. And may the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with hope. Now, the, today's English version refers to God as the source of hope. It says, I pray that God, the source of hope. So hope is not a bad thing. Look at your neighbor and say, hope is not a bad thing. <clears throat> In fact, there's a lot of people wish they had the hope that you have. The Apostle Paul uh, tells us in the book of Ephesians that the only people who have a right in, on this planet to have no hope are people without God and without a covenant. Amen. That's what it says in the book of Ephesians chapter one. The only people on the planet who have a right to be hopeless and have no hope are people who do not know God and do not have a covenant. Well, that doesn't speak of you. You know God. You have God. You have a covenant. Look at your neighbor and say, you have no right to be hopeless. So don't ever go around saying again, I'm hopeless. This situation is hopeless. That is not true. 
not for a believer, not for a child of God. Now get that out of your vocabulary. Amen. So notice once again, the word hope from the Bible, it means a confident expectation. It's also defined as an eager anticipation or belief that something is going to happen or take place in your life. That's a Bible definition for it. A confident expectation. Amen. So when you talk hope, when you say hope, say it with some spunk. <laughs> say it with some enthusiasm. Don't ever say, I'm just hoping and praying. If you're hoping and praying, then do it with joy. Hallelujah. Do it with an eager anticipation of what you're hoping and praying for is going to come to pass. And how do you express a eager anticipation? Well, you start shouting right after the amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You don't wait until you see something happen. You don't wait until you feel better. You don't wait until the bank reports to you that a deposit has been made. No, you begin to rejoice the moment you pray, God, meet that need. God, uh, heal my body. God, do this. God, do that. The moment you say amen, then praise God, you start acting as though you are expecting it to come to pass. That's real Bible hope. Amen. Now, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if you don't have any hope, you don't have anything that your faith can give substance to. Amen. And I've heard preachers stand up and preach against hope. Well, we shouldn't have hope. We shouldn't be hoping. My Bible tells me that I am the recipient of hope from the source of hope. In fact, years ago, there was a guy that that wrote a lot of ugly books about everybody that preaches the word of faith. And when he got to me, now I, I hadn't read the book. Somebody wrote to me and said, did you, hear, did you read what he said about you? I hadn't read the book. I didn't want to read the book. And uh, uh, they said, uh, he, when he, he said, when he, when he came to Jerry Savelle, he said, all he does is go around building hopes up. <laughs> well, I... I found out what the man's address was and wrote him and thanked him for the compliment. Hallelujah. <laughs> he thought he was criticizing me. Yeah, I am. I've been doing it for 50 years, going all over the world, building people's hopes up. But I'm not building hope on fantasies. I'm not building hopes on religious tradition. I'm building hopes on thus saith the word of God. Hallelujah. My hope is in God. And if my hope is in God, and God and his word are one and the same, then my hope is in the word. If I can find it in the word, then praise God, my hope goes up. In fact, I've got so much hope today, it's higher than a Georgia pine tree. Hallelujah. Amen. That's like that doctor told us when Terry's fingers were cut off. Now, it's impossible they'll ever be normal. It's impossible they'll ever grow back. I said, sir, um, that's not impossible. We're believing God. He said, it's medically impossible and I don't want you to get your hopes up. I told him, I said, sir, you're too late. My hope is higher than a Georgia pine tree. He said, it's medically impossible. He even went to Carolyn and said, your husband's in shock. I don't want him to get his hopes up. She said, no, sir, uh, you don't understand. Our God is El Shaddai and there's nothing impossible with El Shaddai. And boy, when God restored those fingers, nails and all, and you could hardly even tell they'd ever been cut off. They'd been cut off right here behind the first joint. When he unbandaged those or took the bandages off those fingers, he lifted both hands and shouted, my God. I said, no, sir, not your God, my God. Hallelujah. Because his God was Buddha and Buddha can't do things like that. Like to me, only thing Buddha can do, get fatter, 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 and uglier and uglier. But he can't replace fingers that have been cut off. Amen. I don't know why anybody would serve something look like that anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just a little side issue there. Okay. And don't write me an ugly letter. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the word is hope. Everybody say hope. hope. Say my hope is in God. My hope is in God. 
Now, once again, hope actually means, from a Bible definition, a confident expectation, an eager anticipation or belief that something is going to happen or take place in your life. Now, winners, where's that? Wait, uh, making winners in life? Are there any winners in the place today? All right, now, that's, that's, our, that's our job. Remember that Freddie Prince used to say on that little TV show? It's my job, man. You know? That's my job. Make winners in life. Talk people into winning. And winners expect to win. Nobody goes to the Olympics expecting to lose. That's the reason they did all that training. That's the reason they did all that, uh, uh, all that discipline in their lives. Amen. And if they even get to the point where they qualify to go to the Olympics, they all are expecting to win the gold. Amen. Winners expect to win. You know, I've been a boxing enthusiast all my life. I still love watching boxing. And, uh, you know, I watched some last night. Hallelujah. Three, I'm, uh, I'm pumped up with a word and I'm pumped up watching boxing. Hallelujah. And they were talking about some future fights that were coming up that I can hardly wait to see. Now, I used to go to all of them, but I don't go to them anymore. I just watch them on TV. But I used to go to all the big championship fights, front row seats, most of the time sitting right behind Muhammad Ali, you know. And, uh, but I don't like the environment, so I don't go to them anymore. And, but I still love watching them on TV. And when they interviewed both of these guys in this upcoming fight, both of them talked like they expected to win. Not neither one of them said, I don't even know why I'm going into this fight. I'll probably get knocked out in the first round. I've never heard anybody that considers himself to be a winner talk like that. Winners expect to win. Amen. And and they were also talking about uh, some rematches that were coming up. That, uh, you know, somebody that was undefeated and he got beat and he's already arranged to have a rematch. Well, why would he have a rematch if he's already been beat? Because he expects to win the next time. Amen. Winners expect to win. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a winner. And I expect to win. And I also expect everything God says to come to pass in my life. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout if you, if you really believe that. Amen. Remember, I taught you a long time. It's what we do, man. It's what we do. Amen. You, 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 had, you hadn't got that yet. And you got to put the motion into it too, man. In fact, we do this at Chariots of Light in our rallies. You know, it's what we do, man. It's what we do. We win. Look at your neighbor and say, it's what I do. It's what I do. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All right, now listen to this. Let's go to Philippians chapter one. And notice, here's a man in prison, the apostle Paul, facing death. And yet he says, in the worst of circumstances, in verse 19, for I know that this shall turn. Now, that's a man speaking what he's expecting. I know this shall turn. It shall turn to my salvation or my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope. Notice he says, what I'm going through right now, even though it probably had been or, or, or was the worst of circumstances he'd ever experienced. And yet he says, I know this will turn. And it's going to turn not only uh, because of your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of God, but also according to my earnest expectation and my hope. He never lost his hope even in the worst of circumstances. 
I think that's what happens to a lot of Christians. They lose hope when, when adversity comes. Yeah. You know, everybody can smile in church. Well, at least some people can. <laughs> everybody can, you know, feel uplifted and encouraged in this kind of environment. Yeah. But, you know, you're going to leave here in a little while and go back home. And, uh, you know, I can't go home with you. I can't jump out of your closet every time you get down and say, hey, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So you're going to have to become your own best cheerleader. Amen. You get that one phone call or you get that, that one letter in the mail or, or that knock on the door, you know, and bad news is coming. That's when people start losing hope that it's not going to change, that it'll, uh, I'll never get out of this. But if you lose hope, then once again, you have nothing for your faith to give substance to. So hope is important. It's vitally important. And notice here, he says, I know that this shall turn. Even though they were coming to his cell and telling him, Paul, you're going to die today. Come on. Has anybody seen this recent movie about the Apostle Paul? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they come to, the, to his cell and say, uh, we're going to take your life today. And his reaction to all that was, uh, promise, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, you promise it will happen today for me to live, or for me to die is gain. If you kill me today, you will help me fulfill my ultimate goal. For me to die is gain. Amen. And to live is Christ. And then he made it very clear as he's writing this letter to the Philippian church that he wasn't going to die in that prison. Not right now he wasn't going to die. No, he was, he was confident. He had this confident expectation that this situation was going to turn. Amen. And so notice that he says, according to my earnest expectation and my hope. Now, faith and earnest expectation conquer all adversity. In fact, you really can't go around saying you have faith if you don't have expectation. Amen. If, you, if you're talking, uh, I'm, I'm standing on the word of God, I'm believing God, I'm exercising my faith, then there comes with that real Bible faith, an earnest expectation Amen. for something to happen. I, I don't ever pray and don't expect results. I don't do that. When I pray, I expect results. That's the reason I did pray. In fact, amen doesn't mean the end. It means so be it. Yes. Amen? Yes. So notice once again, faith and a confident expectation, which is one of the definitions of hope, conquer all adversity. Now, look at Psalm 33 with me. Psalm 33. I want to help raise your level of expectation today. <clears throat> and look at verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear or reverence him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Notice how often the word hope is mentioned there. In fact, the, word, uh, the message translation says it this way. The ones who are looking for his love, his confident, uh, those who have confident expectation and anticipation, 
He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. We're depending on God. He's everything we need. What's more, our hearts brim with joy. Hallelujah. Notice how hope and joy are connected. When you have real Bible hope, you also have joy. Amen. Amen. The person who, who truly has Bible kind of hope, when they say we're hoping and praying that this will happen, then there's an expression of joy that follows it. Not sadness, but that's the way most people have reduced the meaning of hope too. That, you know, we're just hoping. We're just a hoping. How's everything going? Well, we're just a hoping. That's not real Bible hope. Because he said here from the message translation, as a result of them exercising their hope in God, what's more, our hearts brim with joy. Hallelujah. How many of you, you can say today, my heart brims with joy. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice how a confident expectation produces joy. There's a principle in the Bible, and we all know it. It's, it's, it's Mark 11, 23 and 24, particularly verse 24, that implies that what you say and what you believe and what you expect, you will have. What you say and what you believe and what you speak, uh, expect is what you will have. What things, whoever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, and you shall have them. So how important is hope? What you say and what you believe and what you expect is what you will have. And the expectancy comes from hope. Psalm 38, 15. For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Psalm 39, 7. My hope is in thee. The Amplified Bible says, my hope and expectation are in you. Psalm 42, 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now, sometimes you have to, you have to just walk in where you have a mirror Look at yourself in the mirror. I learned this from Kenneth Copeland 50 years ago. Just grab yourself by the ear and pull yourself in the bathroom where your mirror is and, and then take your finger and point at that image in the mirror, which is you. And say, why are you acting like this? Why are you down today? Why are you depressed? Why are you so quiet? Hope in God. Your hope is in God. You don't have anything to be sad about. You don't have anything to be depressed about. You don't have anything to be quiet about. Your hope is in God. In other words, you're talking yourself into winning. Amen? Talking yourself into rising up to a new dimension and a new level of, of faith and hope. The message translation in verse six says, when my soul is down, I rehearse everything I know about God. <laughs> Amen. When, when my soul is down, I rehearse everything I know about you, God. Amen. That's what, that's what David did when he came up against Goliath. You know, how would you like this giant coming at you and cursing you and saying, I'm going to take your head from your shoulders, little boy. And David began to rehearse. This is what he called later in another uh, book in the Old Testament, encouraged himself. He encouraged himself in the Lord. And he said, the lion and the bear came against me and God delivered them into my hand and this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them. What's he doing? He's rehearsing what he knows about God and rehearsing what he knows how God has delivered him in the past. You know, Satan hopes you forget that part. He hopes that you won't remember to do that. He just hopes that, that you 
uh, will just uh, allow the circumstances to be final authority in your life, lose hope, have no expectation, have no confidence, and, and, and then just finally just give up. Amen. But surprise him sometimes. <laughs> Hallelujah. And say, well, Satan, that may have worked the last time, but however, uh, you're up against a new believer, praise God, a different believer this time. And I am not losing hope. I'm not losing confidence. I'm not losing expectation. In fact, praise God, I believe I'll just shout right now in advance because I know this shall turn. Come on, give the Lord a shout in advance. <clears throat> so what do you do when your soul is down in the dumps? David said, I rehearse everything I know about God. Yes. Well, you can't rehearse what you know about God and stay depressed. Amen. 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 Your hope is going to come up to another level. Praise God. Why does the psalmist do this? Why does he say, I rehearse I, everything I know about God? It's because he's learned that his hope is in God. Yes. And since God and his word are one in the same, the book of John says in chapter one, then you could say that your hope is also in the word. Yes. Yes. So if you're down, depressed, feeling as though nothing's working, everything looks impossible, then where should you run? To CNN? No. To The View, no. Dear God, no. <laughs> or some other dumb television show? No, you don't run to that, and you don't run to unbelieving believers. And certainly not the ungodly, the world, and ask for their opinion on this. No, you run to the Word, hallelujah. My hope is in God, therefore my hope is in the Word. Can you say amen? I can't, I can't read the word without being hopeful, confident, expectant. Hallelujah. When it says, my God shall supply. I just have to stop right there and start shouting right, right there. Praise God. My God shall supply all your need. How many? All your need. Hey, that brings on a shout for me. Praise God. According to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, hallelujah. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Glory to God. You can't read the Bible. Truly read the Bible and remain hopeless. Glory to God. So if God and his word are one and the same, then doesn't it stand to reason if Satan is trying to steal your hope? then run to the word. Don't run from the word, run to the word. Hallelujah. Amen. And allow your hope, your confident expectation to rise up within you. Now listen to this statement. You might want to write it down. <clears throat> you cannot separate what you are truly expecting from what will actually happen. You cannot separate what you truly expect to happen from what will happen. And I might say, good or bad. You're going to get what you expect. Amen. People go around saying, well, you know, they're laying off down at the factory and I'll probably be next. And then when they get laid off, they say, I don't know why I got laid off. Well, you <laughs> prophesied it. Well, you know, the flu is spreading all through our office. Dear Lord, I'll probably be next laid up for weeks with the flu. And then when they get the flu, Lord, why did I get the flu? You prophesied it. Amen. You're going to get what you expect, good or bad. Well, if it works both ways, why not go for the good? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. You're all familiar with this story. <clears throat> and once again, you can't separate what you are truly expecting from what will actually happen. 
Here it says that Peter and John at the gate called Beautiful come in contact with a certain man who was lame from his mother's womb. Look at verse 2. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. Now that's a key point. They laid daily at the gate of the temple. Jesus went through that same gate many times. Why didn't he get healed when Jesus came through? He didn't expect it. He didn't expect it. Now, on the other hand, blind Bartimaeus, when he heard Jesus was nearby, he began shouting, Master, have mercy on me. Why did he start shouting when he heard that Jesus was nearby? Because apparently he had heard that Jesus had healed other blind people. And it built hope. It built expectancy just by the fact that he was nearby. He couldn't see him. He wasn't close yet, but he went to shouting. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Just, just the fact that he had heard. He hadn't seen Jesus yet. Apparently Jesus hadn't even opened his mouth yet. But he heard that Jesus was near. And it created hope. It created expectancy. And of course, the people said, shut up. Leave, leave him alone. And the Bible says that Barnabas shouted even louder. And it wasn't his loud shout necessarily or only that attracted Jesus. It was the hope and the expectation that had come into Bartimaeus as a result of just hearing that Jesus was nearby. Now, Jesus walked through that gate several times, I'm sure, while he was still in the earth. But why didn't this man, whom they laid there daily, come on. Come on. why didn't this man get healed? Because he didn't demonstrate any hope. He didn't demonstrate any expectancy. And Jesus is not going to force healing on anybody. Amen? Amen. Getting quiet in this church. <laughs> but then notice when Peter and John came by and they were about to go in the temple and uh, he began asking alms of them. But I want you to notice a key phrase here, expecting to receive something. In verse 5, expecting to receive something. So this time, when Peter and John came by, and they knew, or he knew, that they were disciples of Christ, now all of a sudden, he's expecting something when he finds out that they're nearby. Now, he, was, he, he asked, you know, to receive strength, he actually asked to receive alms. He asked them for money. And they responded by saying, silver and gold have I none. And I've heard some of the most horrible sermons preached on that phrase. <laughs> well, the disciples were poor. See, Jesus wants you poor. No, that's not what that means at all. You know, I've, been, I've gone to churches at times and gave money in, uh, to people in the parking lot, just reaching my pocket and, and, and the Lord impressed upon me to give somebody some money that I met in the parking lot. And then on the way into church, God impressed upon me to bless somebody else. And then somebody else get blessed. And by the time somebody else came to me and said, uh, Brother Jerry, I need some help. Well, silver and gold have I none. At the moment. I'm not broke. I just don't have any at the moment. I don't have access to any at the moment. They weren't broke. Who knows who else they'd ministered to before they got to this guy? Religion is dumb. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense at all. And it's designed to destroy your confidence in God's Word. But the key point is, he wouldn't have even asked them for money if he wasn't expecting now, even though they said, silver and gold have I none at the moment, 
But such as we have, give I thee. And he wouldn't even have got that if he wasn't expecting it. He was expecting something. I heard one preacher say, ask for arms and he got legs. (laughs) Praise God. Just a little humor there, praise God. If you don't think it's funny, I didn't come up with it. It was another preacher. Okay. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 8. <laughs> Matthew chapter 8. And let's, let's remember the point now. You cannot separate what you are truly expecting from what, you, what will actually happen. You get what you expect. It works in the negative, but it also works in the positive. Thank God for that. Now, you're all familiar with this story of the centurion who comes to Jesus and says, I have a servant sick, sick you know, and, and uh, Jesus responds in verse seven, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And he goes on and talks about how that he is a man under authority, a man who has authority. I tell a man to do this, he does it. I tell a man to come, he comes. And then he's saying, in essence, I recognize authority in your words. That's the reason he said, you don't have to come to my house. Speak the word only. It says in verse, uh, what is it? Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, I've never seen such great faith as what I'm seeing right here. Amen. In the mind of Jesus, great faith is faith that leans on the confidence or the authority, rather, the authority in the word alone. Amen. Amen. So the man said, you don't have to come to my house. Just speak the word and my servant shall be healed. But the point I want to reach is verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, go thy way and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Now remember one of the definitions of of hope, the Bible definition of hope is not only uh, a confident expectation, but eager anticipation, anticipation or belief that something is going to happen or take place in your life. And so here the man had hope and he had faith that if Jesus just spoke the word, then his servant would be healed. And Jesus said, all right, go your way. As thou hast believed, so be it unto thee. Amen. So notice once again, you can't separate what you truly are expecting from what will actually happen in your life. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, how many of you are truly expecting the prophetic word this year to come to pass in your life? Let me ask that question one more time. How many of you, no, listen, no, wait, 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 wait. I want, you to, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. How many of you are truly expecting the prophetic word to come to pass for this year in your life? Hallelujah. And what is that prophetic word? Marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. Amen. I expect it every day. I get up expecting it. But if you're not expecting it, then it's not likely to happen to you. And that's what I've seen year after year. Every time I come in here or go into other churches all over the world and I, and I declare the prophetic word for that year, so many people have told me over a period of months, getting closer to the end of the year, well, Brother Jerry, that didn't come to pass in my life. More than likely, they didn't expect it. They mentally assented to it but they didn't truly expect it. If you expect it, then you have eager anticipation of it every day. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Not only that, you talk it every day. I, I, don't, I don't talk this just on Sunday. 
Most of you are not around me every day, but if you were, you'd hear me talking this every day, several times a day, praise God. I'm expecting it. Not only that, I'm experiencing it, hallelujah. I've had some marvels and wonders and extraordinary manifestations happen just in the last few days, hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. One more time, I said glory to God. Amen. I get up every day expecting it. And if you truly expect it, you're going to talk it. Hallelujah. Not only that, you're going to be rejoicing all day. Just in anticipation of it. And remember one of my favorite scriptures, Job chapter 5 verse 9. He's the God of surprises. You get up every day looking and expecting surprises from God. Amen. Amen. So once again, once again, what is the Bible definition? A confident expectation and an eager anticipation. And when it looks as though nothing is happening, I will not stop hoping. Yes. Listen to Psalm 71 verse 14. But I will hope continually. I will hope continually. And then he goes on to say, and yet will praise thee more and more. Notice how his continual hope is producing more and more praise. Yes, I don't think all of you got that part. His continual hope was producing more and more praise. People that truly hope, truly expect, truly are confident, you can't shut them up. You don't have to get a crowd like that. Oh, come on, let's praise God. Come on, come on, come on, let's praise God. No, you can't shut them up. You, it, it's hard to get them to stop. I, I, I thought I was in a crowd like that this morning. I said, I thought I was in a crowd like that this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Confident expectation caused him to praise God even more, even before it came to pass. That's one of the ways of determining whether or not you're really expecting it to come to pass. Amen. If it hasn't produced joy, it hasn't produced praise and thanksgiving, then I question whether you're really expecting it. I've often said over the years that praise is one of the greatest expressions of faith. If you can praise God before you ever see anything that has happened, that's one of the greatest expressions of faith. I think we ought to stop right now and praise God for marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations, even before they happen. Come on, give God your best praise. Give God your best praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Tap somebody on the shoulder and tell them you can be seated now. You've also heard me say, and I got this from a supernatural visitation of the Lord in Liberty, Texas, a number of years ago. I had no idea it was going to happen to me, but he came into my room and, and, and gave me a message about the God of the breakthrough. And at the close of what he said, he said, and you go in there tonight talking about the God of the breakthrough wants to visit their house. And then you tell them this, and the depth of their praise will determine the magnitude of their breakthrough. Yeah. Amen. The depth of their praise will determine the magnitude of their breakthrough. Just how big a breakthrough do you need? Amen. How big a breakthrough do you need? Glory to God. Amen. Amen. So if you're truly expecting and anticipating marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of your God, you cannot stop praising Him in advance. You praise Him after they happen, and you praise them, anticipating them happening again. Amen. That's the Bible way. Hallelujah. Now, let me show you something very important in the word this morning before we 
change the order of service. Let's go to John chapter five. Are you receiving? Are you increasing in your level of expectancy? John chapter five. And I'm relating stories to you that you already know, but it doesn't hurt to go back and read them again because there's, uh, the word of God is inexhaustible. Hallelujah. Let's begin in verse one. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, when he saw him lying there, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Now notice, this man had lost hope of ever recovering. I'm convinced the only reason he keeps showing up at that pool is out of religious duty. Just the way a lot of people show up for church. Not here, but other churches. They just show up for reli- out of religious duty. They, they just want to be able to, you know, get the check uh, in attendance. Well, yeah, we went to church last Sunday, you know. This man does not expect to ever be healed. He's been this way for 38 years. Now, it doesn't actually say how many of those 38 years he came to that pool, but apparently it had been a lot. But he reached the point where he never expected to be the first one in the pool because the legend said that when that angel troubled the water, the first one, not the third one, but the first one in the pool would be healed of whatever disease he had. So he had lost hope and he expressed that he had lost hope when Jesus uh, said, uh, "Take, you know, uh, wilt thou be made whole? And the man responded with a hopeless answer. Sir, I don't have a man. I don't have a man because even if I try to get up and get in the pool first, someone always gets in there ahead of me. So why is he even showing up? Because he doesn't hope. He doesn't believe. He doesn't expect. He doesn't have any eager anticipation. What's he, what's he trying to do? Uh, wait until everybody's healed and nobody else shows up and now he'll be the first one in? Well, that might take a long, long time. He could die before that happens. But notice what produced hope. Even though he was hopeless, Jesus said, wilt thou be made whole? The sound of being made whole. Hallelujah. When you've been crippled for 38 years, just the the thought of the possibility of being made whole, wouldn't that inspire something on the inside of you? Amen. Wilt thou be made whole? And of course, the man answered with a hopeless answer. But Jesus ignored that. And he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, that would not have happened if the words of Jesus hadn't, first of all, produced hope. Amen. Amen. So how important is hope? We talk about faith a lot. But hope is a biblical principle. Without faith. Without hope. Amen. 
So hope is this eager anticipation that something good is going to happen. Yeah. It's, this, it's this confident expectation that something good is going to happen. This man had lost his hope of anything good taking place in his life, but notice how Jesus' words changed that. So how important is the word when you're feeling hopeless? Amen. How important is the word? Don't run from the word. When, when, when things look hopeless, run to the word. Yeah. Glory to God. I fell in love with the word of God 50 years ago, and I have never lost my passion for it. Yeah. I, I'm passionate about a lot of things. You can ask my wife. You can ask some people in here. I am passionate about riding motorcycles. I love riding motorcycles. No, you don't understand. I love Riding motorcycles. I'm passionate about classic cars. Oh, hallelujah. I, I'm passionate about being around close friends. You know, when, when, when I know Jesse's coming, it just, it just does something in my heart even before he gets there because I know we're going to have some fun. I know there's going to be a whole lot of laughing going on. <laughs> Amen. Uh, when I know I'm going to be in, the, in Brother Copeland's presence, I know something good's going to happen. Amen. I mean, if we don't do anything else, but I stand there and listen to him preach, which more than likely that will happen. <laughs> I don't care if we're eating, he's going to preach. If we're riding a motorcycle, he's going to preach. If we're fishing, he's going to preach. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He's going to preach. Isn't that right? <laughs> he's going to preach, praise God. And I love it. I've been listening to him preach for 50 years, and I don't get tired of it. Hallelujah. And he's living for the day that we can just preach all day, all night, and never quit. You know? <laughs> Amen. So, when you're hopeless or feeling hopeless, and actually you should never feel hopeless according to the Bible. But Satan tries to slip it in occasionally. Run to the word. Amen. Amen. I like what the apostle Paul said about Abraham when it looked as though what God had promised him would never come to pass. Now, the King James says he hoped against hope. The message translation reads it this way. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Listen to this. Deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw, but on what God said he would do. When, when everything was hopeless, Abraham uh, decided to believe anyway. Not on the basis on what he saw, but on what God had promised. So don't ever give up on God's word. Don't ever give up on God. Let the word be final authority in every year of your life. And then I'll close it with this scripture, Psalm 37 and verse four. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Does anybody have a desire to have marvels wonders and extraordinary manifestations taking place in your life this year. If you have that desire, would you raise your hand and say to me, I have that desire, Brother Jerry. All right, now, the, the way it happens is delight yourself also in the Lord. There's a prerequisite to it. Delight yourself also in the Lord. In other words, have a passion for God. Have a passion for His Word. Make the word that which excites you more than anything else. Amen. The message translation says it this way. Keep company with God and get in on the best. Hallelujah. Keep company with God and get in on the best. So staying in his presence, continually praising him, staying in his word are vital if you truly want marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations to take place in your life this year, I could have also been an attorney. I rest my case. 
Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a good shout. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, somebody stand up. And as you do, shout on the way up. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen and amen. Now reach over and lay hands on somebody next to you. And pray this prayer for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want everything that they are believing for in their lives today to come to pass for them. But I know that is your desire even more so than mine. That's what you want taking place. And I pray that today as they've heard the word, their faith has grown. Their faith has been inspired. Their hope, their expectation their anticipation of the prophetic word for this year. Marvels, wonders, extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God coming to pass in their lives. Your word declares, if any two of us agree that our Father will be in the midst of our agreement, and bring it to pass. I'm in agreement. And I believe in the name of Jesus that before this year is up, they'll have more and more testimonies of marvels, wonders, extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. And we believe we receive it. We anticipate it. We are eager about it, and we give you praise now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Give somebody a high five and say, I believe every word of it. Amen, amen. Okay, Justin, come on. All righty. You can be seated. (laughs) Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory. You know, uh, <laughs> I've been laughing over there, just having so much fun listening to this. It's, uh, it's oh, goodness gracious. It's so rich. And uh, this morning I was uh, praying. I got up really, really early, and I've been had some stuff stirring in me throughout the week about just seed time and harvest time and how important that is for us as a church is we're confessing the word. In our, in the, and some of you should have all these. Most of our members should have one of these right here. And that's a confession that Dr. Savelle had written after the word of the Lord from Brother Copeland. Um, and he went and ministered over at EMIC. And then he brought it back over here to the church. And we put on note cards. And you'll get to confess that with us here in just a few minutes. But as I was uh, meditating on that and just asking the Lord, because it's all about seed time and harvest time. Amen? Amen. As long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest time is always going to be in existence. And I talked a little bit about expectation, and uh, this morning I had two songs. Y'all know me, I'm always singing, so I had two songs going through my head, and I thought, you know, Lord, uh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, ministered in the first service, and uh, the first one was Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and uh, he's got high hopes, you know, he's got high apple pie. You remember that song? Yeah, just what makes that little old man, right, think he can move that rubber tree plant. Everyone knows that an ant can't move a rubber tree plant, but he's got high hopes. He's got high hopes. He's got high apple pie in the sky. So that's going through my spirit, man, this morning. I'm going, Lord, really? And so, uh, and then the other one is an old, what's that? (laughs) He didn't get the sermon from Frank Sinatra. We know that. Amen. Hallelujah to Jesus. The other one was a um, song that was really dear to me, but uh, just strong on the inside of me. And uh, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. You know, our expectation has got constantly had to be stirred up. We live in such a 
a world that is just trying to take that away from us every chance that they can. And the reality for us is we got to dig into it. It doesn't fall off like ripe apples off a tree. Faith, Brother Hagin used to always say, keep the light switch of faith turned on. Keep the light switch of faith turned on. Brother Roberts preached that uh, sermon on uh, your seed faith. And it's seed faith. And faith, and uh, the scripture that really came up strong in my spirit, man, this morning about this was hope maketh hope. Where Dr. Shavell just got ministered, hope maketh not ashamed. For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. When we have an understanding of the love that God has for us, and it comes times for us to sow a seed back into him for what he's done for us, it's so easy because we recognize that love himself is the one who gave us that seed, and love himself is endeavoring and desiring. We can't rob him. We should not rob him from pouring back into us, and he's using the tithe to do so. That's his love for us. He wants us sowing. He wants us tithing because he wants to pour out a blessing. There's not room enough for any of us to receive it. He wants to rebuke the devourer for our sake. And he's, he's just asking us, do you know how much I love you? Do, I, do you know how much I love you? I, I'm taking care of this stuff for you. Don't worry about this stuff. Trust in me. Put your hope. Put your expectation. I guarantee you that you will reap what you sow. Do not be deceived. Change your way of thinking. That word deceive comes from deception. Deception has a perception. What is your perception this morning? Is it that high hope? So as we get ready to sow this morning, we get ready to confess the word of God this morning, our hope, our expectation, our excitement is in the revelation that we know that God loves us and he's trying to increase us more and more. He daily wants to load us with benefits. He daily wants to load us with benefits, but our expectation has to be daily. There's a book in the bookstore back over there, just a plug, Every Day's a Blessing Day. Dr. Chavelle wrote that book a few years ago. That is a great book to help trans transform your mind to thinking that God wants to get this blessing to you every single day of your life. This is the year of abundant harvest for marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations, but it's all dependent upon our expectancy to receive it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, receive the tithes and the offerings online. Text to give. There's an envelope if you need one. Uh, there's one in the in the seat back in front of you. If you're on the front row, ask someone to hand you one from behind. We're going to confess. It'll be up here on the screen. We're going to confess the word of God because it will not return void. Amen? Amen. Say this with me. Genesis 8, 22. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Therefore, I sow my seeds in faith, knowing that the law of seed time and harvest is working on my behalf. Genesis 1.11, and God said, let the earth bring forth after his kind, and it was so. Therefore, I have sown my financial seeds, and I am expecting them to produce after their kind in the form of financial harvest. Mark 4.26-27, so is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed in the ground, and the seed should spring up and grow up. Therefore, I am expecting every seed that I have sown to grow and to spring up and to produce an abundant harvest. Job 36, 11, if they obey and serve him, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Therefore, because I have been obedient to God and I have sown my seeds, I fully expect my days to be filled with prosperity and by years with pleasures. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Therefore, since I did believe in the world, my God, and I believe what his prophet has spoken regarding 2019 being our year for the abundant harvest, I am expecting this each and every day throughout this year to come to pass in my life. In Jesus' name, so be it. Woo! See the offering. And while they're, while they're receiving the offering, just a few announcements. And we have a, just a couple things you can just, just bear with us, uh, just some things we want to do today. 
Um, but just a couple announcements. This coming Wednesday is the last Wednesday of the month. So Steve and Sandra Baldwin, we have our food outreach down at, at Stop 6 off Ramey Avenue. So if you want more information about that, it's the Boys and Girls Club. But that's the last Thursday of every month from 11 to 1. Wednesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday. And um, that's from 11 to 1. If you're going to serve there, get there between 9.30 and 10. But it, it's a great opportunity. You know, one of the things that we're believing for as a church is have a team of 500 that go out and serve the needs of our community. So that's what we're pressing for for 2023. Also with that is, is what we're pressing towards for this community is by 2023, we'll be at 2,000 people. And, and so there's things we're believing God for, new buildings, the gymnasium. There's things that we're, that we're believing God to, not just, not just to expand, expand sake, but to impact this community because that's what this ministry is all about, is about influence. It's about influence in the lives of people. Also, Wednesday night is about victorious living. We have three different things going on right now. And here we talk about walking with God. And we also have a marriage class going on and also a financial class going on in our back modules of the buildings. So uh, Nikki will be ministering the word this week on uh, Nikki Deaton will be ministering the word this Wednesday on walking with God. And so if you're available, come out to our Wednesdays. It's a great time. We, we say miracles happen on Wednesday nights. Amen. <laughs> miracles happen on Wednesday nights. So we'd love to see you. Um, you know, I know still, they have a few more rows to do, but I want you to go ahead and watch this video. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning in thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. The faith movement is not over. Let me even correct that statement. It is not a movement. It has never been a movement. It is a lifestyle. Teach my people faith. It is written. 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 Are you ready for your miracle? Hallelujah. I want humanity set free. That's the purpose, praise God. The curse has been broken. The curse has been broken. Somebody shout unto God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What's on my life and what's on my ministry is going to come on you. Praise God. Dr. Savell and Miss Carolyn, and this is just a little something from us, you know, a picture just to honor you for 50 years, and, and you know, if you had different gifts and things that you wanted to honor, honor them with, and make sure we'll, we'll get those to them. Uh, I'll let you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. You know, and I, I wanted to share something with you, and you talk about, when you talk about heritage, and that's what we are, your heritage, Dr. Savell and Miss Carolyn. There's a scripture that came to mind, and, and you read this this past week at the President's Cabinet about reaching to other men's borders in 2 Corinthians 10. But in verse 15, it says, We do not boast, therefore, beyond our proper limits over other men's labors, but we have the hope and the confident expectation that as your faith continues to grow, our field among you may be greatly enlarged. So what I want you to know as, as a church and part of your heritage, as you brought the word to us, that we're going to cause that, that territory to be enlarged. Because we are a branch of Jerry'sville Ministries, and we're going to do everything that God's called us to do within this community to expand your commission. Amen? You know, we think about, I just appreciate just 50 years of faithfulness, 50 years of preaching the word. You know, and you never know the lives that you affect and the lives that change and the lives that they in turn affect. I was thinking about this, and I was driving back, and I text you a message. I'm gonna text you a message and ask you about a date of something, and and because the Lord reminded me of a story, um, the church I came out of in Maryland, it was on the eastern shore of Maryland, and it was my knowledge the only word of faith church on the east eastern shore of Maryland, 
And my pastors, they, they didn't grow up word of faith. And, but the, um, her name was, we called her Mom Mom Davis. And she had rheumatoid arthritis, almost confined to a wheelchair. And, and she, had, she had seen, had gotten, gotten something in the mail to go to Charlotte, North Carolina, to a believers convention in 1980. And it was 1980 at the Charlotte Convention Center or wherever that Coliseum or whatever. And, uh, and you ministered the word there. All week she had been believing God for her healing every day. And she was in serious pain, had to walk from the parking lot, you know, um, up, up the steps. And, and every day she was there the whole week, didn't miss a service. And every day in pain. And that last service, I think you might have ended up having to do the last service in 1980. I don't know if that was the fourth man. When, when you did the fourth man, you weren't supposed to preach. Well, by the time she was still in pain when the service was over, but by the time she walked to her car, she was totally healed. That was 20, 29 years ago. And, and, and so with that, thinking about that, they came back and they started listening to your teachings. And, and, and little did they know, I would start going to their church and hearing the message of faith. And so just thank you because I was affected by that. That message changed my life. So, so, so we want to honor you. We want you to know that we are your heritage. We're so grateful that you are our founding pastor and you're the apostle of this house. And, and like I said, we just love you and just so grateful to be a part of this ministry. You know, when we leave, we have cupcakes for everyone. So when you leave, <laughs> grab a cupcake. And, uh, and, you know, we have the 50 back there. And like I said, it doesn't have to be today. If the Lord puts on your heart, I, I, I'm, I, we're a firm believer in honoring the gift. They don't, they don't, need, they don't need your money. They don't, they, they don't need finances. God has blessed them. But I do believe in honoring the gift. And whether it's now, throughout this year, and the Lord places something on your heart to go, just go to them, just, just write them a note. Give them a testimony of what their ministry. Maybe it's, a me maybe it's just one message. Maybe it's a phrase. Whatever it is, leave them a note and sow a seed and honor the gift. Honor 50 years. 50 years of laboring. You know, hearing Jerry Ann talk that when they grew up, that, that they, he was gone 30 years out of the 50, 50 years. Gone on the road. 20-some days a month gone preaching the gospel away from his family. I hear the stories of in Africa in 1970s when, when no one else was necessarily going to Africa in those areas and places and looking up in the stars saying, I miss my family. But thank you for, thank you for doing that. Anyway, let's give him a hand. Everyone sing you for Hallelujah. And... Uh, and, when I, and, I, and I'm saying these things, I'm, I'm not saying them to just Dr. Savell. I'm saying it to Miss Carolyn because they're one. They're a team. And, and, and it takes the support of a woman of faith. You know, you're here, I believe, today is because of a woman of faith after you had the stroke standing by your side. And so, Miss Carolyn, we honor you. Amen. Thank you. you know, even, even this morning at the... Even during my message this, this morning, I, I, I conveyed on how I learned to pray and how the Lord directed me to learn how to pray, and that came in 1999 when, when I was in Bible school listening to your class on the principles of prayer. So thank you so much. Amen. We love y'all. God bless. <laughs> Have a great week. Later. Uh-huh.